appreciate it. Thanks everyone for coming today. It's great to see all of you and whoever is joining online. I'm really excited today to teach you or talk to you a little bit about old growth forests, especially because this is such an opportune moment for that. There's so much happening in this domain, both in the United States and in Europe. I have a lot of information to share with you and we'll just see how we do with the, with the time. So with no further ado, we'll get right into this. I'm hoping that you'll come away from this talk with these four key points. First of all, in both North America and Europe, we now have a much better understanding of how much old forest and primary forest is left and roughly where it is. We're getting closer and closer to having comprehensive maps of the remaining old forests on, on both continents. There are major initiatives underway in both the US and Europe to conserve and actually restore additional old growth forests. So we need to really break this part out. Like what, what does that mean to restore an old growth forest? How would you do that? What are the practices that you would use? Is it even possible? And I hope to make a really important point that this is not a one size fits all approach. We can use both passive management, wilderness, reserves, core protected areas, as well as active silvicultural restoration techniques. These are complementary approaches. We can use some of both. But to do any of this, we're going to have to take an adaptive approach because just like everything in sustainable forestry, the world is changing. And we're going to have to grapple with all aspects of global change. So we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Okay, so I have a lot to cover. And I'm just going to start off by introducing you to the gestalt of old forests. Like, what are they? What do we mean by old growth forests? Well, certainly when, when you hear that term, old growth, you might envision something like this, right? Like huge old trees. People often think of the redwoods of California, what some people have called the cathedral old growth, a place with enormous awe-inspiring trees. This is right across the lake in the Adirondacks, where we certainly have that. And these are amazing forests. But it is easy to romanticize a little bit, maybe idealize and to, to look for some kind of stereotypical condition that we might think of as old growth. Maybe a forest like this, this is near Ampersand Mountain on an early winter day, some leaves are still on, dusting of snow, deer path into this old growth forest there. And you know, we might think of a forest that's complex like this with big old trees, but also trees of all sizes and ages, and then very large accumulations of organic debris, both standing and down, it's down woody debris, a rich herbaceous layer perhaps. And certainly you can find a lot of old growth forests like this that have this full complement of features in this way. But not always. Old growth comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. Sometimes we find all those characteristics Sometimes we don't. So we have to really expand our conception of what an old forest is and the different, uh, the different forms that it can take. This is a quote from the book that was mentioned, came out a couple of years ago, where we sort of started off by acknowledging that, that when we say old growth or maybe virgin forest or primeval forest or ancient forest, it, it evokes something, right? Sort of this connection, this very ancient primeval place. And you can almost imagine yourself in that forest. There might even be a certain sense of nostalgia perhaps for, for the past and for a time when there were more forests like that. But modern contemporary ecology, what we've learned in the last 30, 40, 50 years about old growth forests paints a different picture. And as I said before, those characteristics that I mentioned earlier, like large trees, just as an example, sometimes you find them, those, sometimes you don't. Depends on site productivity, depends on disturbance history, depends on human influences, all kinds of things. And, and furthermore, we now understand old growth as very dynamic systems. They're shaped and sculpted over time and space by natural disturbances, by climate variability, and sometimes by indigenous influences as well, which we'll just briefly mention today. I wish I had more time to talk about indigenous relationships with old forests. But we have to recalibrate our eyes and the way we think about them. So old growth forests are messy. They are structurally complex. And that messiness represents niches 
represents habitat, represents processes like carbon exchange and, and nutrient fixation and all sorts of processes that are a result of these dynamics. So that's probably the, one of the most important things that ecologists have learned about old growth systems in the last 30 or 40 years. So just a little bit more to set the stage so we all understand what we're talking about. So I'm sure there are varying levels of familiarity with old growth ecology, what an old growth forest is. So when we use this term old growth, we're typically talking about a structural condition. So by structure, I mean the architecture of a forest and functional the processes that it carries out like uh, carbon uptake, carbon storage, hydrologic regulation, those sorts of things that develops late in stand development. And it develops these conditions as a result of a whole variety of different mortality processes, tree mortality processes, like density dependent mortality. This, this is essentially competition between trees, self thinning that breaks apart the canopy, brings in light from the forest floor, allows shade tolerant species to regenerate, then develop vertically, giving you a multi layered canopy. And then other mortality processes like density independent mortality that occurs late in ecological su succession. So this refers to things like natural disturbances, wind throw, ice storms, insect outbreaks, root rots, pathogens, this sort of thing that breaks apart, oops, this forest mosaic even further leading to horizontal complexity, patchiness, patch mosaics. So there are a variety of processes that lead to this condition we call old growth. Now it's important, there's a reason I'm stressing this because these are processes that we can emulate silviculturally through active forestry practices. So later we're gonna talk about old forest restoration and this is what we have to be thinking about, how we emulate these natural processes of forest development. Okay, so that's what we mean, what we mean by old growth. Um, currently there is, a resurgence of interest in indigenous uh, North American relationships with old growth, especially as we see old growth kind of taking center stage nationally in terms of the number of Biden administration initiatives. And we're hearing uh, indigenous voices a lot more saying that indigenous crop tribes and groups have managed forests for millennia in North America, interacted with forests in lots of different ways, through cultural burning, through intercropping systems that we once had in the mid-Atlantic states in Eastern North America, through intentional clearing of forests to create berry fields and game habitat and all sorts of other things. And I think there's an understanding that that has also been lost, that that indigenous influence has been removed from our forests in many cases. And, 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 but it's important to reintroduce those cultural practices. Now I wanna say that indigenous views of old growth are just as varied around North America as are indigenous cultures themselves. So we have to be really careful not to generalize about these or to simplify them. And we'll find different views about old growth among the tribes. Um, and, and that's very interesting. If we have more time, we could, we could talk about that a lot but I'm not gonna go into that in, in great detail today, although I'm happy to discuss it with you later. It is, it's a really interesting topic. But I also wanna point out that old growth is not restricted to North America, and it is not, it, it is not entirely, it, it is, no, not, I'm not gonna put it that way. It is not a human construct. Some have argued recently that old growth is a, is a human conception, an abstraction, that, um, that there is no such thing as old growth, that all forests globally are the outcome of anthropogenic influences. This is an, ar an argument that is, is being made. I disagree with this argument, and I'm going to tell you why. I disagree because old growth forests are a biological reality. This is an ecosystem type that occurs globally that species are co-evolved with, co-evolved. And we have different types of old growth all over the world that have interacted with human soci societies in lots of different ways, regardless of whether those human influences are indigenous or from some other human group. Um, these are examples, old growth Pacific Northwest, old growth Europe, old growth in Bhutan. So think about this point for, for a minute, the idea that old growth is part of human history 
and humans in, have interacted with it for thousands of years around the planet. The old growth cedar groves of Lebanon, think of their importance in antiquity. Uh, the sacred Himalayan hemlock and silver fir groves in Bhutan and Tibet. Uh, again, a completely different cultural context there. There are even recorded records of old growth forests in Northern Europe from, nor from, from Roman times when Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, what is now France and Belgium, he recorded the presence of a forest called the Meridal Forest and it is now Belgium, it's still there. So my point is that older forests have been around for a long time and human societies and cultures have interacted with them in lots of different ways. Yes, we have an indigenous scenario in North America, but we also find lots of other ways in which human societies have interacted with old growth. That's just the point I wanted, wanted to make there. It's a complicated one, but interesting, I think, philosophically. Okay, so now a little bit about what's happening right now in the U.S. and why this is a, a timely thing to be talking about. You might have heard a year and a half ago, the Biden administration uh, issued an executive order called Safeguarding America's Force. And it called for a whole variety, variety of things. So it uh, called for us to deal with the megafire problem in the West, it called for us to uh, develop adaptation plans to adapt the national forest system for climate change. And it also called for the nation's first ever inventory of mature and old growth forests. What do I mean by the term mature? Mature is essentially a middle-aged forest. It's kind of halfway along that developmental sequence that I showed before. So mature and old forests. And this is extremely welcome because we can't really conserve old forests or even restore them until we know what we have left, right? We have to know where the last remaining examples of old forests are, and then think about conservation strategies, but also restoration as a complement in and around the areas where we have remaining old growth. So flash forward to, I guess, last spring, May, the inventory had been completed and was released and then just in December, President Biden issued another executive order that amends all of our national forest plans. So for the entire U.S. national forest system and BLM lands, Bureau of Land Management, it amends all the existing plans calling for conservation and stewardship of full growth forests. So now it's been thrown back to every single national forest around the country, including the Green Mountain National Forest of Vermont, has to come up with a plan for conserving old growth forests. So this is happening. And it's, it's, it's about time because uh, the U.S. has been behind the curve on this uh, for a while. So we have this inventory now. This is sort of what it looks like. And it was developed from a national monitoring system that we have for forests managed by the U.S. Forest Service. It's called Forest Inventory and Analysis, FIA. And this is a grid of plots that we have nationwide on both public lands and private and to some extent tribal as well. And using these plot data, we've generated some estimates. These are just estimates of where mature and old forests would be nationwide. Notice I'm using this term estimate because if you have scattered plots across the landscape, you can't really map the old growth. You can just estimate which areas of the country are likely to have more. You can interpolate and extrapolate a little bit to sort of map out areas where you think you would have some concentration of old growth, but it's not quite the same as explicitly mapping old growth. So we're making progress, but we're still well shy of a national map of old growth. Another limitation here, this was only for national forests and Bureau of Land Management lands. So not national parks, not national uh, refuges, wildlife refuges, no state forests, and not private lands or tribal lands. So think of the Eastern United States. We pick up some of the national forests in the Appalachians, Green Mountain, White Mountain National Forest, Allegheny, but we're missing the vast majority of forest lands in the Eastern United States, which are not federally owned. They're in state forests or they're in private forests. So for example, I can tell you that our largest concentration of old growth forests in the Northeast is here in the Adirondacks. Adirondack State Park, completely missing from the map. So there's still some gaps in this, but we can address those hopefully moving forward. 
I'll just mention really quickly that there are a whole variety of competing methodologies that have been proposed to inventory and classify the nation's forests. This is just one example. Some use remote sensing methods, uh, LIDAR, multispectral imagery. Those all have their own limitations. The, 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 the characteristics that you're able to map with LIDAR are somewhat simple, somewhat limited. So even that, that approach misses some things. This is a very interesting methodology that was proposed at the same time the Forest Service was issuing theirs, and it relies on carbon accumulation curves. So it's the idea that oh, wait, we could maybe take a completely different approach and we could look at carbon accumulation in every type of forest across the country, and we could determine the threshold at which we reach about 95% of maximum carbon accrual, accrual in a forest. And that would be the break point at which we would decide anything older than that is old growth. This was a very interesting and novel approach. Hasn't been put in practice yet, but the point being that we're still working on the right way just to classify what is old growth, let alone actually map it. So we're gonna see a lot happening in, in the coming years. The Forest Service has also very recently, just a couple months ago, completed a threat analysis using that inventory I just showed you. So we now have also a good sense of what the major threats are to the remaining old growth that we have. We think about 6% of the national forest system is old growth, is remaining old growth. So a relatively small amount. Most of it's in the Pacific Northwest, a few other places, like Southern Appalachians, boundary waters, but there are major threats out there. Megafires, first and foremost, I'm sure you're all familiar with this problem. Massive wildfires that we're getting every year as a consequence of fire suppression over the last century, fuel accumulation, but then also drought and climate change. Other things as well, drought, insects. In the Eastern US, United States, it's actually rural housing development, actually not just the Eastern US, also parts of, the, parts of the West as well. California, Great Basin, it's rural housing development pushing up into fire prone vegetation and fragments in our landscapes. So that's also a major threat to old, old forests. Okay, so that's a little bit about what's, what's been happening recently in the U.S. that sets the stage. I don't have time to talk about Canadian efforts, although there, I just will say that the Canada has its own initiative to, to, to map and conserve its old forests. We're going to jump across the pond now to Europe and, and set up the context there. So a second ago, I said the U.S. was a little bit behind the game, and I'm not sure if that's a fair statement, but yeah, I think it is, actually. So what, why did I say that? Well, because Europe has actually been at taking the lead now for more than a decade on just the, the, the whole idea of like continental scale conservation plan for old growth forests. The Europeans have been interested in inventorying old growth across the, the EU now for a number of years. And in the 20 teens, Europe created the first world heritage network of old growth conservation sites. So they began with old growth beach forests like this one in the Carpathian mountains. This is just one chunk of the Carpathians as it swings through Ukraine on its way to Romania and then up here into Poland, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, Hungary, et cetera. So they started with this, and then this is now expanded and it's pan-European. So all the way from Mediterranean beach forests to northern beach forests in Germany and Denmark. So pretty remarkable. Some of you might be familiar with the World Heritage Convention, and you might know that we typically use that for sites, individual sites. Here's one of the first example of a World Heritage Network. Kind of cool. Very cool, I think, in my opinion. So Europe already had that, but then there was some research, some of which I was involved with, with, which I will present to you in a minute, showing that the remaining old forests in Europe are truly at risk, that we're losing them at an alarming rate, um, both where they're unprotected, as well as where they are supposed to be protected inside of national parks and other protected areas. There's a major problem with illegal timber harvesting in Different parts of Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, countries like Romania, Ukraine, illegal timber harvesting inside of national parks and other areas has been, uh, has been rampant for a long time. Um, nevertheless, the EU recently released its own conservation strategy now. So building on that World Heritage Network and expanding further, 
This was issued in 2020. It's a biodiversity strategy for 2030. It calls for conserving, mapping, and restoring old growth forests across the EU. So unprecedented to really think about that. The European approach is grounded in mapping and inventory, just like the US approach. But then the idea is once they know where the old forest is, it would be conserved in something called the Natura 2000 network, which is another network of protected areas that Europe has established across the continent. And this is again why I'm saying maybe they're ahead of us a little bit in terms of conservation thinking, sort of developing these continental scale protected areas networks. So that's the way this is supposed to work. But notably in Europe, it's not just conserving what's left, the biodiversity strategy also calls for restoring additional old growth. So we, we're facing that question there as well. How do we do the restoration part? Okay, so now a little bit about my own research. So I've been part of a, a large group led by, by researchers at Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany for a long time. Uh, try to accomplish some of those goals. So we started off by trying to inventory Europe's last remaining old forest. It's just like North America, we didn't have a complete map of, of old forests. There had been studies around the continent, like these locations of old forests, um, but no comprehensive map or inventory. And because we don't have a map, um, we, had to, we had to approach it some other way. So we used a modeling approach, much like the US inventory, to try to predict, to predict, to model where we were likely to have old growth. So we used data from all these locations around Europe where old growth had been studied, including some landscapes that look like this. This is in Slovakia, in the Tatras mountain along the border of Pol Poland, that is a primary forest landscape. So a large wilderness area that has never been cleared. And here again, you see the role of natural disturbances, right? Mm -hmm. uh, landslides, bark beetle outbreaks, um, uh, wind storms, uh, other things, creating this very dynamic primary forest landscape. So by the way, just sort of a side note, it's just not true that Europe doesn't have places like this. It's not true. Europe actually has quite a bit of old forest left and you can even find places like this where you see, see these dynamics happening at a landscape scale. Okay, so we use those data in this uh, modeling approach where we identified all of these various variables that predict the occurrence of old growth, where we're likely to find old forests. We use this kind of uh, bootstrapping method, partial dependency plots to predict which of these were most predictive of old growth. So where do you gain the highest probabilities of old growth occurring based on various combinations of variables? And again, through that modeling approach, we then produced a map. So this is where we predict we would have old growth um, European wide. And based on this prediction, we concluded that, yeah, there's quite a bit of old growth out there, as much possibly as 1.4 million hectares across 32 countries. If we add in Russia, which was missing from this, this number triples because there's a huge amount of primary forest in Northern European Russia. 89% have some protection, but only 46% are strictly protected in IUC category one or two uh, preserves. Remaining, meaning a lot of it remains open to logging, which is part of the problem. So the next step, once we had that inventory, was to do a gap analysis. You guys familiar with that term, gap analysis? So you determine how well protected something is within an existing protected areas network. And you look for the gaps. So where is something not well protected? So we, we use that approach here, European-wide, but a, a little bit of a twist on it. So we mapped the protection gaps so where do we have old forest that's not well protected? But we've also mapped upgrading gaps. So these are places where the protection status could be upgraded or improved, as well as restoration gaps. So where are the greatest opportunities to restore more old forest in and around those remaining fragments to restore larger, more continuous areas of old forest? So this was kind of an interesting exercise and we concluded that 
it would only take a relatively modest 1% expansion of the protected areas network in Europe to capture all remaining old forests. And this would constitute only 0.3 of 1% of uh, Europe, Europe's land area. So relatively big bang for the buck if we protected what was left in Europe. But we're still faced with this question. So how do we actually restore old forests? It's one thing to say, yeah, we could, you know, there's an opportunity, but how do you actually do it? You know, and, and it's the same question that we're debating in North America. Should we rely entirely on passive management, so setting aside wilderness areas and wildland areas, or is there a role for active restoration in some places as well, using silviculture to accelerate forest development, like I said at the beginning, leading to that old growth condition? My opinion has always been we can use silviculture. These are complementary approaches. We don't need a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, okay, so that's where we stand in Europe. So now you have a setup for both North America and Europe. So now on to the question, how do we do this restoration? What is that gonna look like? Well, we can look to this field of silviculture that we call ecological silviculture. So it's the idea of managing forests sustainably in a more ecologically friendly way to provide habitats for biodiversity and ecosystem services and all that good stuff. And we can look at all of the various different silvicultural systems that have been tested. This is North America now that we're looking at here. I should have said that. It's a paper we wrote a few years ago, a big group of us. We can look at the systems that have been tested for ecological silviculture and start breaking them down a little bit and figuring out which one, which, which of these would work for old forest restoration. And you know, we have to recognize that some of these are not really about restoring old forests. They're they're more about adding structural complexity to managed forests, to build in ecological characteristics that are missing from our managed forests. So that's what a lot of ecological silviculture is focused on. We have some other systems that have been tested that are really more explicitly about restoring old forests, including that more research here in Vermont that I, I hope I have time to mention today or to go over, as well as some systems that have been tested more for their adaptation values. So how do we adapt forests to climate change and, and shifting species ranges and species migration, so those, those sorts of questions. Okay, so we have, we have a range of options to choose from. That's my point here, but we need to focus on these that are really explicitly about promoting and restoring old forest structure. So thankfully, we have some examples of that kind of silviculture, both in North America, as well as Europe. Uh, in Europe, they call that sort of an approach, instead of ecological silviculture, they use the term close to nature silviculture. And they mean something similar, but also a little bit different. So we can start comparing some of these approaches. This is my own system here in Vermont that I've tested for about 24 years. It's called structural complexity enhancement. It means old growth forest restoration. Um, but I'm not the only one that's been working on this. We've had people working on old forest restoration all over North America, Canada, and the US, uh, a little bit of Mexico for a long, long time, uh, dating back really to the early 90s and the timber wars and the old growth forest battles of the Pacific Northwest, Spoon Spotted Owl, all that kind of thing. You might recall that all of that resulted in something called the Northwest Forest Plan. It was developed under the Clinton administration, the country's first ever bioregional system of protected areas. It's now under revision for a lot of good reasons, but we, we have this system of late successional old growth reserves across the Northwest, Northern California, Western Washington. They look at this map and you might think, okay, this is a huge patch or area of old growth forest. Actually, it's not, they, they aren't. Those are areas where you just have concentrations of old growth forest left, but it's still highly fragmented within those areas. So an explicit aspect of the Northwest Forest Plan was old growth restoration. That means you can go into those reserves and do this. You can do something called thinning from below the canopy to emulate density dependent mortality I talked about before. So you basically thin out the less vigorous trees, allowing the trees that remain to grow faster. And then you use a technique called underplanting, 
to bring in shade tolerant species like Western hemlock, Western red cedar, that will then develop vertically giving you a multi-layered canopy. So this is basically the form that old growth restoration takes in the Pacific Northwest. These days though, so much of the conversation is about fire and with the mega fire problem out West and we have lots of old growth systems in the Western US, ponderosa pine, Jeffrey pine, sugar pine, all those pine systems that are fire dependent, that now have accumulations of fuels and fire ladders resulting in the mega fires. So to restore fire dependent forests, we have to do fire restoration. And that, by the way, is also really important in our fire dependent forests in the eastern United States as well. We have systems just like that in the southeast, the Gulf states, and even here in the north, they east in places like the Pine Barrens and coastal New England and across central New York. We have systems like this, fire dependent systems that will require the reintroduction of fire to restore old forest characteristics. So that's all I'm gonna say about fire restoration today, but I want you to be aware that that's a huge part of this, this conversation nationally. Okay, back to the Northeast. So the approach that I've tested here is called structural complexity enhancement. This is a study that we put in quite some time ago. Um, it's a replicated randomized block experiment. We have several different treatments that we're investigating. The old growth restoration treatment is that, that is compared alongside more conventional selection harvesting systems. The study is here on the side of Mount Mansfield, right along the Butler Lodge Trail. You might have hiked past it without realizing that it was on either side. There's a replicate of the block at the Jericho Research Forest, and we've also used data from Paul Smith's College in the Adirondacks. Started the project in 2001, treatments were put in in 20, 2003, and we've been out there remeasuring, resampling every couple of years ever since then. So the way this works is I started with everything we could learn about old forests as a reference, as a baseline. So I and others have done quite a bit of work studying old growth forests in the Adirondacks, but also other places, White Mountains, Maine, field places, and we learned about all these dynamics. We learned how these forests develop. What are the processes that lead to their development? And then I came up with a variety of silvicultural techniques or practices, each of which emulates some of those developmental processes. So we talked about that before, the tree mortality that leads to old growth structure. So this would be things like creating small gaps, or thinning around some of the dominant trees to free up growing space so that those trees would grow faster, enhancing downwardy debris, creating tip-up mounds, a whole variety of things. We did that about 20 years ago, and we've been monitoring it ever since, and it's actually been fairly remarkable 20 years later to see the outcome and, and how well it's worked in some places. It didn't always work. We learned as much from our failures as we did from our successes but that's, that's part of experimental ecology, right? That's the way it works. And again, this approach is compared alongside um, single tree selection and group selection, just sort of asking the question, well, what could you do with conventional silviculture if you didn't want to do this? Okay, so, and we've looked at, okay, well, just, so this idea about emulating natural processes and disturbances, that was part of the study. So emulating things like gap dynamics, that lead to these structural characteristics over time. And we did that a couple of different ways. I'm gonna move on. How do we know if it worked? Was it successful? Uh, well, I've approached that a couple of different ways, uh, starting with the biota, biodiversity. And we've looked at responses across a wide variety of taxa, understory plants, salamanders, uh, birds, small mammals, a variety of things. These are just some data on the fungal responses. These bars here show you the increase in the richness of the fungal community after the old growth restoration. That's this one as compared to the controls and the more conventional harvests. So it's interesting to see the massive increase in the diversity of fungal species following the old growth restoration. I've also looked at carbon. So we've looked at the carbon accrual, accrual curve after the conventional harvest, and we've looked at the carbon accumulation curve after old growth restoration. And really the interesting thing here is that 
the old growth restoration technique came within about 16% of the baseline as compared to the conventional harvests that were much lower. So this suggests that if you do old forest restoration, it can also constitute a carbon forestry technique. It works for carbon as well. I should move right along. I've been running out of time. So that's just a little bit about sort of the form that old growth forest restoration is taking in North America. So you've seen several different examples. Now jumping over to Europe, what are they doing there? Well, I mentioned that for decades, actually for almost a century, old growth, I'm sorry, Europe has had an approach that they call, they call close to nature silviculture. This is in Czech Republic. And it's beautiful, it works very well. It, it works great for converting spruce plantations to mixed species. It works really well for increasing the structural complexity of a forest, for instance, by creating small gaps or openings, then planting beech and diversifying the, the forest in a number of ways. But it's missing some things. It's missing creation of large legacy trees, like we did here in Vermont. It's missing standing dead trees, down trees, tip-up mounds, gap mosaics, a whole variety of other characteristics of old forest. Forest. So my contention has been close, that close to nature silviculture in Europe is a good starting point, but we're going to need something more to really get to full old growth restoration. I'm really running out of time here, sadly, so I'll have to go through this last part really quickly. Um, I'll just mention that a variety of people are working on approaches like that in Europe, testing a huge number of different approaches. Um, my most recent work, I did this for my Fulbright in Austria, my last sabbatical, attempted to develop a guide, a guide for how to do this in Europe. And we, we were interested in something called a comparability index that would help foresters compare the way they manage forests with the way mother nature does, through natural dynamics and disturbances. We use data on disturbances in forest management from 13 countries across Europe, we compared those forest management effects with the effects of natural disturbances. Again, to try to figure out how far off these natural processes were from the way we manage forests. We did this for five different forest types across Europe. And we developed this thing, the comparability index, that is now meant to guide this kind of restoration forestry in Europe. And see if this animation works? Yes, it does. So these spheres represent the space, the three-dimensional space, that forest management occupies as compared to natural disturbances. And that's using three different parameters, the frequency of disturbance, the residual structure left by disturbance, and the size of disturbance. So now we have a way of conceptualizing how far off human management is from natural dynamics. And then we could do these bivariate comparisons like this, punching an algorithm through these relationships, and we can actually calculate index values that foresters can use to, to better manage their forests. That's the idea here. Okay, so we have some guides. This is the last thing I promise. I think in the last, <laughs> last minute or two. Okay, so we we you know we're making progress here. Like we have silvicultural cultural systems that have been tested in both North America and Europe. We have quantitative guides to help forest managers figure out how to do this. So this idea of old growth restoration is no longer theoretical the way it was in the 1990s when this was first proposed. We've actually done it. People are doing it. So that's promising, very promising. But it begs the question that we have to answer for all sustainable forestry, which is how do we do this in the context of global change? And global change presents a lot of challenges. We have mega fires in the West. In Europe, we have bark beetle outbreaks, uh, increasing windstorm frequency, drought, and even forest fires now that are unprecedented in many parts of Northern Europe. So the world is changing, disturbance regimes are changing. We have invasive species, we have species migra uh, migration, range shifts, land use pressures, all these things that we have to grapple with. So, but my contention has been that old growth restoration is no different from any other type of sustainable forestry in that we have to take an adaptive approach. Okay, so this is the only thing I have to show you today about adaptation is that 
it, it seems that if we restore old forests and if we conserve old forests, that in and of itself might be an adaptive approach. Here's why. Okay, so this is an analysis um, led by Dr. Dominic Malone. A uh, bunch of people from the Guns Institute were involved with this. We used something like 8,500 forest monitoring plots from across the hemiboreal region of Eastern North America. Hemiboreal means the transition zone between temperate forests and boreal forests. So FIA data from the US and Canadian National Forest Inventory data from Canada. Some very complex Bayesian modeling run on the supercomputing cluster here at UVM. And we basically looked at a whole variety of ecosystem services and biodiversity indicators in relation to forest age. So how do these ecosystem services relate to forest age? How do different taxa relate to forest age? We looked at those associations under the current climate, under a future predictive climate. And then we looked at the difference between associations now and how they will occur in the future. And what we found, I'm making a very complicated story short here. What we found is that the associations between ecosystem services and biodiversity in relation to forest age remain intact. They remain more intact in older forests with a changing climate than they do in younger forests. If we add climate change to the mix, these ecosystem services start breaking apart in younger forests, meaning our future forests will function differently than our present, future, uh, present forests, except for the old forests. They remain more intact. Why? Well, old growth forests, complex canopies, they buffer their, their own microclimate. So they have resistance to climate change. They have other attributes that seem adaptive. So we've concluded from this that managing, conserving, restoring old growth forests may in and of itself be an adaptive management strategy. So that's promising. Okay, closing thoughts. Um, to summarize some key points, we can learn a lot through this kind of comparative approach, like looking at what's happening in North America and Europe. I think that's helpful. Oops. Um, but to do any of this, we, we need to start with these comprehensive old forest inventories. And as I, I hope I've shown you, although we've made great strides, we're still not completely there. We don't have explicit maps for old growth on either continent. Restoration is no longer theoretical. We know how to do it and we have examples, but there's no one size fits all approach for this. Old growth restoration is gonna take lots of different shapes and sizes depending on where you are. And all this has to be adaptive to global change. There we go. And so thank you.